Ladies and gentlemen, uh, good afternoon and uh, welcome to this press conference from the fourth day of the 49th annual meeting of the World Economic Forum here in Davos. Thank you for joining us here in the room. Thank you for joining us on the live stream. Whether you're watching on Facebook, Twitter, or our website, we are definitely very happy for you to tune in. So uh, thank you very much. Um, you're joining the press conference here today that tries to answer the question, how can business improve inclusion of people with disabilities? Um, I think it's a topic that has admittedly probably been very much underrepresented in, in previous annual meetings of the World Economic Forum, so we're particularly pleased to correct that wrong today here with a fantastic, uh, fantastic panel. And let me introduce quickly our speakers here today. Uh, to my immediate left, I'm joined by Caroline Casey, uh, who is the founder of uh, Valuable and a young global leader of the forum as well, if I might, might add. Uh, to her left, we're joined by Julie Sweet. She is the chief executive officer of North America uh, of Accenture. Um, to her left, uh, we're joined by Duncan Tate, who's the uh, brace yourself for this title, President and Chief Executive Officer, Europe, Middle East, India, and Africa of Fujitsu. So basically ruling the world uh, as far as Fujitsu is concerned. And then to his left, we're joined by Ashok Vaswani, who's the CEO of, um, of Barclays uh, in the United Kingdom. Um, and if we are lucky, we'll be joined any minute now uh, also by Paul Pullman, the CEO of Unilever, who is in the building already and on his way uh, to join us here. Uh, Caroline, um, without further ado, uh, thank you very much for being here today. Uh, I know you have an exciting announcement uh, to make, so please, uh, the floor is yours. Um, well, it's wonderful to be here, and I really want to recognize uh, this great moment uh, to see disability business inclusion um, at such a center stage of the World Economic Forum annual meeting. Um, I'm going to give a bit of context uh, around disability. There are 1.3 billion people in the world who have a disability. 80% acquire the disability between the ages of 18 and 64, which is workforce age, 80% of those disabilities are invisible. Now, the scary stats are um, you're 50% more likely to experience poverty if you have a disability. You're 50% less likely to have a job. The ILO have reported that disability exclusion is costing countries up to 7%. If you're a child with a disability, UNICEF have announced 90% of children with disabilities don't have an education. So this is an inequality crisis. It is the biggest marginalized group in the world. And so how do we solve this? It can't be solved by charities and governments alone. We need the most powerful force on this planet to be part of this conversation, and that's business. We've seen business use its huge social muscle in the past. We've seen that, and it, we've seen it here in the World Economic Forum. Because inclusive business creates inclusive societies. So why are we not seeing business engage so much right now around disability? Well, there's lots of reasons, and here are some. One is leaders don't really have the confidence to talk about disability in the way they have other issues. We have some great ones today here and later at our main panel, but we don't see it. And EY did a report saying 56% of board members had never or very rarely seen disability on their board agenda. The second issue that we know is causing huge issues is the competing elements of the diversity and inclusion agenda when we see ourselves pitting one issue against another. And we have another awful statistic saying that 90% of companies around the world prioritize diversity, but only 4% consider disability. The third issue is universal design, which we know is profitable, has not been taken up as mainstream. And fourthly, though the economic case and the return on investment for business is, is, is there, it's proven, whether it's around brand differentiation, talent acquisition, retention of next generation, whether it's about the market of eight trillion, we are talking about just under 20% of our global population. It's a huge opportunity for business and it's dreadful to see it not be taken, but there are social consequences to that. And so that gives you a, a sense of why this is so important. And we know that leaders, big leaders and big brands and big platforms can change it. And so here today, Am I allowed to talk about the Valuable 500, what we're doing? Oh, please, go ahead. So, we have a solution. Um, well, one that we believe kind of captures both the opportunity that exists 
and the moment. So today I am so proud to announce the launch of the Valuable 500. It's a very emotional moment for me because it has been a long time coming. The Valuable 500 with our strategic partners, One Young World, Omnicom and the Virgin Media Group are challenging in 365 days for companies around the world, 500 companies around the world, to put disability on their board agenda, signed off by the CEO, make one commitment for change, and shout about it externally and internally. It doesn't matter if you're just starting, if you're scaling, or if you're leading. You are all welcome. You are all included. We started this with One Young World for hashtag valuable. Today, we launched the Valuable 500. And I want to be really, really positive about something. The voices of the next generation have made this happen. It was through One Young World we found our voice. And mindful that this generation, the generation that cares so deeply about inclusion in a way that we have not maybe before, they have helped us create a film which is being launched right now called Hashtag Diversish and the World Economic Forum have launched it online through our blog or their blog. So it's live. And from this moment on, we are opening for business. The Valuable 500 website is just gone live. 365 days, we have to find 500 of you. There is a counter clock on it to make sure that we stick to targets. This will be the tipping point, the tipping point to totally release the economic, social, and business potential of 1.3 billion people in the world, an inclusion revolution that leaves nobody behind and ends diversive inclusion. I have to acknowledge at this point my huge, huge gratitude to the World Economic Forum. Um, I was a YGL in 2006, and I've been to Davos many times. In 2010, I said I would never come back until we got this on the main stage. At 5.30, we have done that. It is a moment in history and it needs to be acknowledged. I want to also thank our partners. This is not about one individual, Caroline Casey. It's about a global movement of collaboration together. And we have expert partners like Access Chat, Business Disability Forum, RU Global. We have, we have the Marketing Society. We have ILO, GBDN and the Purple Space. We will galvanize this. We will make it happen. And I also need to turn to the great valuable leaders, because without them, this would not be possible. Janet Riccio, Richard Branson, Mark Weinberger from EY, and I am so delighted that the leader who helped me start it all has just walked into the room. I would not be here if it was not for the leadership and the courage and the absolute tenacity and support of Paul Poman, who seems to do this for everyone, but he stood for us, for this tribe of 1.3 billion, and I need to acknowledge his leadership. Thank you. Thank you much. Uh, thank you very much, Caroline. Wow, what a wonderful announcement. Um, uh, we could almost close the press conference <laughs> yes. here because uh, you're such a tough act to follow. Uh, Julie, I don't envy you, uh, but nonetheless, I'll, I'll, I'll come, come to you now. Um, so at Accenture, um, you've, you've seen the importance of this issue and, and you joined, this, uh, you, you joined this, uh, this pledge, but you've also done some research uh, uh, on the topic. If you could talk about these two points to our audience, please. Sure, well, I have no doubt, Caroline, that with your passion and commitment that we will reach the 500. And I'm very proud to be here today representing Accenture's global commitment to disability inclusion and to join the Valuable 500. And I will say that, you know, the World Economic Forum, when people say what it's all about, this is what it's all about, putting the spotlight on these important societal issues that are good for business and they're good for people. And so it's, it's very exciting to share this moment uh, with you and with the World Economic Forum. At Accenture, we have always believed and we've seen that diversity and our commitment to a culture of equality has been an incredible source of innovation and creativity. And we've seen the benefits of that from strong financial performance to relationships we've built with leading companies like the ones here, and also um, becoming a magnet for talent because the best talent in the world wants to work at companies that are committed to diversity. They want the excitement of it. 
A few years ago, we recognized that we needed to focus more on disability inclusion, and we started taking tangible steps, as we've done in other areas like gender and LGBTQ. We made action plans. We focused on hiring, on accessibility, and on mental health and mental wellness. We did things like create programs across the world, creating mental health allies. We deployed new technologies to allow those with physical disabilities to participate in our very collaborative culture. We're only still at the beginning, a few years in. We have clear action plans, and it's been on our board agenda for yep. some time. We've seen the benefits, and last year, we wanted to test whether our experience right, was, uh, was shared by other companies who were also champions. And so we partnered with Disability In and the American Association for Persons with Disabilities to look at the 140 companies that participate in the Disability Equality Index in the US to compare their financial performance with uh, those who were not champions. And it was a clear yes that the inclusion, disability inclusion is an advantage. Those companies that were champions to return two times the value to their shareholders, they were higher in revenue, and it was a great affirmation of what we had already experienced. Today you may have seen that the Business Roundtable, a group of the top 200 companies in the US, issued a, it issued a report about the importance of innovation. Well, everyone who has diversity and is committed to it knows that you cannot have innovation without diversity. So we believe that the business case and the imperative is only growing stronger as companies recognize they have to be continuous innovators. So we're really excited to continue on this journey. We know that we have a lot more to do, and it's great to be able to learn from other companies. And I'll just close with a personal story. In 1985, I was a freshman in college, and it was, I did my first volunteer service that wasn't selected by my parents. And I happened to volunteer at a local organization for teens with mental disabilities. I'd never been connected. It just happened to be an opportunity. And I learned and got more out of that volunteering than I gave. But at that time, what made me really sad was these teenagers were soon to age out, and they had no path to a life other than living in a group home. Three years ago, I um, got to partner with Marriott's foundations Bridges from, uh, called Bridges from School to Work. And we've hired individuals very similar to those I volunteered to help. I have an apprentice in my own office. And I saw the completion of what it really means to provide a path. And of course, there's all kinds of disabilities. 80% are invisible. Whatever um, the disability there is, the value of providing a place for real people to be able to you know, have a great job and succeed, it's, it's, it's really you know, just it's, it's life changing for them, but also for us as a company. So really excited to be a part of this. Thank you very much, Julie. Duncan, uh, it's not getting easier for you. The second speaker also was fantastic, so no pressure, yes, please. I've, I've spotted that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so um, let's let's hear from you about Fujitsu, uh, sure. Fujitsu's um, uh, commitment. And especially I'd like to hear from the, uh, uh, how you combine purpose and profit. Okay, good. So. Um, Good afternoon, every, everybody. Um, so at Fujitsu, this is really simple for us. You know, our customers are going through great change. And I see it as our job, as our customers are disrupted by technology, it's our job to help them thrive in a digital world. And quite simply, what we need to be able to do that is really great talent. Now, Julie mentioned before about, about diversity. I think it's absolutely right. And Fujitsu, over the last seven years, have taken this really seriously front and center of the way we of w the way we do business and when you get great people in front of our customers we end up doing things like we've done for the royal bank of scotland where we've used quantum computing to help them manage 120 billion pounds of high quality liquid assets but you can only do that with great people and it means you have to take diversity really really seriously now seven years ago when our journey first began the first step we took was to enable our leaders to be comfortable and confident with the language of disability. That was our first step we, we took. The second step was to give our employees evidence that we were also taking it seriously and they could be confident in us. 
So we set up a network called SEED. It's our disability network, and anyone can join it, whether you are, have a disability or not. It's now, we're, I think, in the top 10 of disability networks around the world. And we've seen a real change in the number of our people who identify as being disabled. When we first started, it was 3%. And the stats that I got this morning, it's 13% of our people, almost at your one in seven number, almost. So I think we've made great strides. We've got so, so much more to do. Uh, our graduate recruitment is, uh, is showing this. We are forcing, and I use the word force, deliberately, the people who provide us with talent, including our own recruiters, we're forcing them to prove they fish in diverse pools. Of all of our graduate intake every year, 20% of these people now will identify as having a disability. And this is great to have inside the company for all the reasons you mentioned, Julie, and they are really seriously helping our customers. The other thing that we've, we've done, which is in a dynamic organization like us where we form teams to help our customers, you're gonna have different line managers regularly. And there is nothing worse for disabled people than having to have another conversation with a new boss to say, I need adjustments because. So in Fujitsu, we have cut this out. We have a thing called the disability passport. When you move from manager to manager, the new manager picks up the passport and knows exactly what they have to do to enable you to be productive. This is all aimed at us making people's lives easy inside the company so they can be productive for the people we serve and they happen to be our customers. So I said we have way, way, way more to do, but it's been a great journey for, for us. Uh, I think our customers are feeling the impact of it. And the things that we've just done, we had an employee vote in our UK business, and our UK business have chosen to partner with Autistica, which is an autistic charity, about helping to get people into work and live really meaningful lives. And we're going to use and develop policies of digital technologies to help that as in our two-year partnership with, with Autistica. So, Caroline, we are completely committed to this. Not only are we going to continue to do it, we are also going to go and recruit other companies. So we're going to take a, a, a target in your top 500. It's a great initiative. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Duncan. I did you wrong. You're a great speaker. <laughs> so um, I think one thing that, that might make us optimistic about the, the success of the Valuable 500 is that we have so many different industries and no. sectors represented here. Um, so uh, Ashok, you're, uh, you're representing the financial sector, um, and, and Barclays as well is joining uh, Valuable 500. Share your perspective uh, on the issue with us. Why is this a key issue for Barclays? And I'm feeling the pressure. Yeah. <laughs> uh, OK. Uh, so Barclays actually has uh, a relatively long uh, history in dealing with this issue. Uh, John Wally, who was our chairman uh, uh, maybe even 10 years ago, uh, signed up Barclays to be one of the founder members for, business, for the Business Disability Forum, uh, which made a lot of progress uh, in the UK. I later sat on that forum uh, as a board member, and they're doing some really, really fabulous work. Uh, I uh, am the executive sponsor for uh, disability at Barclays, across uh, Barclays, uh, the whole Barclays group. And uh, what I've tried to do is try to really bring this down to very simple business, you know, a business rationale as to why this is very, very important. And let me try that message today with this group. So I have just three things uh, basically to say. The first thing I want to say is that when people talk about disability, the usual vision or the usual image that occurs is a lot of extreme uh, you know, disabilities. I submit to you that when I turned 40, I magically started wearing glasses. And at 45 and 50, I'm wondering why restaurants are so dark, because it's virtually impossible to read the menu. right? So in that case, I am visually impaired. And I'm a normal person, but I have visual impairment, right? And therefore, when we think about disability, we should think about disability in a continuum. Now, thank God I don't have extreme disability, but you know, a lot of people have some kind of difficulty uh, you know, in their day-to-day in their -day lives. Without my glasses, there's virtually nothing I can do. So I think, I think normal people kind of you know, can relate to that. If that is true, then it has to be true that a lot of our customers are going through the same thing. And if you're a truly customer-focused business and you're trying to get something done for the customer, then you must take into account the kind of difficulties that the customer has. That is my job. That is what I should be doing morning and evening. 
And therefore, we said that we must go about designing products for customers who are living with our products along this continuum of disability. Which brings me to the second point, which basically says, we cannot think of disability as something at the end of a product design or at the end of a service design. This is something that you must do right at the start. In fact, I would submit to you that if you design a product or service, keeping this in mind and thinking about the extremes, the outcome that you get out of it is much, much, much better, right? I'll give you a very simple example. You know, all of us in banks, of course, issue a whole bunch of ATM cards. Now, our ATM cards, our, our brand colors are blue, so our ATM cards are dark blue. Now, a lot of people have difficulty with dark blue as a color. A young, a young person, literally, you know, uh, in our bank, and, you know, he met somebody in the branch. The, the customer told him that dark blue really doesn't work for him. So he says, okay, what color works for you? And he said, yellow. And he said, okay, I mean, if you're printing dark blue, can I just print yellow? And he printed yellow, and that particular person's card turned out to be a yellow card, which that person used and loved. And so he came and told us, and he says, you know what? Why don't we allow customers to choose color? And somebody says, if you're just stopping them from using color, why don't you just allow them to put whatever photograph you like? And therefore, on my debit card, and you know, I can show it to you, I've got a picture of me and my daughter. Now think about it, what a phenomenal product differentiation. Now when I take out my wallet, guess which card I love, right? <laughs> right? Absolutely not gonna love any other card. I'm gonna love the card, which has got a photograph of me with my daughter. Now this all started because some customer found it difficult to deal with dark blue, right? And therefore my second point is in designing products and services, think of the extremes, right? And if you think of the extremes, you'll get a better product out anyway. Which then leads to my third and last point. My third and last point is, look, again, don't think of disability as something which is a permanent kind of situation, right? Mental health is a classic case, right? There are times when you go through a lot of stress. You feel very overwhelmed. I feel overwhelmed at times, right? At that point in time, I'm going through a very difficult time. At that point in time, it could be that my judgment is impaired because I'm under so much pressure. But it's a temporary thing. I find ways to get over it. I do something about it. But temporarily, I have a disability. And therefore, getting our colleagues and thinking about them and making sure that they are in good mental health in this instance is so important. To Duncan's point, all our businesses are undergoing so much change. There is so much pressure, right? It is not unusual that these things would happen. And so we designed a campaign uh, which was called This Is Me, where senior leaders and anybody else who had the courage to come up and say, look, this can happen to me. So I have this issue. My photograph, this is me. And we kind of you know, put this all over the bank to say that this is, not, this is not restricted to any kind of level, grade, hierarchy, age. This could happen to everybody. The mayor of London loved it, and they've adopted the this, this is me campaign all across London, for example. So we are very, very committed to uh, this program. We would love to learn from other organizations, because I think this is something where we can commonly take it on. I think you laid out, Caroline, the case very strongly. Hopefully, the three points that I make tell you that you don't need any further business case. It just makes sense to do it. So just let's do it. Thank you. Ashok, thank you very much for your commitment. Paul, you were late to the press conference, but you were, on the other hand, very early in supporting this cause, as Caroline uh, point, pointed out so eloquently. Um, so um, we would like to hear from you uh, about the importance that you see in business leadership here, and of course also about uh, what, uh, what Unilever is doing uh, in that important yeah. space, please. I apologize, but we were working actually with some countries trying to have them pass legislation that would uh, actually deal with these issues. Like we succeeded in some countries in the world I'm very passionate about that. I work myself for uh, my foundation that I have with my wife for blind people. We have uh, 25,000 blind kids in Africa that we support. And the biggest issue that we have is advocacy, uh, especially in regions where it's very difficult to have normal education for, uh, for anybody. 
then the disability gets pretty quickly excluded. I'm pretty humbled by what I hear, and I would learn, like to learn more. Like, is Fujitsu is already 13%. Uh, that's pretty impressive. I think you'll hold the world record on that one, and what you're all doing, uh, Barclays, yourselves, and Accenture. Uh, it's so so uh, pleasant to, to hear that we're amongst like-minded. But that's not the case if you really go outside of this room. I think that's why we have the place on the podium. We'll, we'll get to 500 without any doubt. But we've been able to attack the issues of gender equality. We haven't made the progress we want, but at least we talk about it and we have to publish and some countries put uh, legislation in place. The same with HIV or LGBT, uh, now with uh, mental health. And yet it's very, very difficult to get disability on the agenda. And it's surprising to me if you look at the Sustainable Development Goals, which we work a lot this week in Davos and where we're falling behind, uh, the objective of the goal is actually to leave nobody behind. Uh, you're talking here about a population of 1.3 billion. You'd think you'd focus on that. Anybody who has common sense, and if you then look at the purchasing power, I'm sure Caroline has talked it, of about 8 trillion, you'd be stupid not to deal with this from a purely economical point of view, let alone the moral compass which some people might or might not have. I'll leave that up to anybody else. But um, anywhere you look in terms of statistics, you have to be worried. In, uh, only 20% of, of the people are in, in employment. It's a sure way to leave a lot of people behind. And I don't like to talk disability because I don't believe in disability, actually. And I don't believe that there are normal people and disabled people. I actually believe in diffability. It's a small change in two uh, letters. But diffability says, actually, we're all different. I'm a very bad basketball player. I cannot sing. My wife has made that clear to me many times. But nobody has accused me of having a disability. We all have diffabilities. And if we, come, if we want to solve the world's problems at large or inside of a company leverage the, the full power of diversity, which we all well know, then we have to embrace this diffability everywhere that we are, including people that what we now conveniently call disability. Interestingly, technology is developing so fast in this world, also with people with visual impairment, for example, that a lot of the people that we will call disabled and have unconscious bias against are actually able to do much more than us. With the people that have visual impairment that I work with, I can tell you the majority I meet, first of all, they know how to operate in a FUCA environment and are a little bit better prepared for the world we're going to see. But secondly also, and if you look at purely technology, they're often 10 miles ahead of where we are because for them it's just a normal way to live their lives. So if we can just harness that disability that we all have, then we will also be able to quicker close the... Um, the uh, gaps that we have on the Sustainable Development Goals. I don't want to talk about Unilever because I'm very humbled what other companies are doing. But uh, we've now, as my retirement, I was very pleased that the company wanted to step up and, and I think it's a wonderful retirement present when they committed that they were going to hire another 8,000 uh, people with uh, disabilities in the company. And that's probably the best present I could get after 10 years uh, working there. So. Uh, 500 is a minimum uh, that we have to set with the 500 valuable campaign. I know that is doable, but that's not really the ultimate goal. The ultimate goal is just to be sure that this is um, addressed in any company in the world and that we ultimately leave no one behind. And that's what I'll be fighting for until the day I move on to better pastures. But again, thanks for uh, the passion, as you can see, that uh, Caroline exhibits. I thought it was a setup when I came to One Young World in Colombia and I had jet lag. So I thought I'll go to this room where all these young people are with enormous energy uh, just to stay awake. And as I came in, there was a panel on disability and Caroline was leading that panel with the normal passion that you've seen just now. And she said if only the business community would stand up and leaders like ourselves, and she mentioned my name, would have the guts to come up. I thought it was the biggest uh, setup that I've ever entered to in my life, and I still can't believe it today. But anyway, I went on the podium, and we got another uh, 10 business people that were in the audience uh, pledging it. And then we asked people to stand up who were fully behind this campaign. Everybody stood up. You'd be stupid to sit down. And, uh, you know, and there we go. It was um, Helen Keller, who was blind and deaf, who said that the worst thing is uh, not to be blind. The worst thing is to have eyes and not see. 
And unfortunately, we still live in a world where too many people have eyes and don't see. And that's the mindset that we need to change. And this campaign is the first step of that. And my final word will be a word of gratitude towards the WEF because they've put four or five major events on uh, uh, in this week around disability, and I'm very grateful for that. So thank you. For thank you, that. Paul. I'm, I'm tempted to ask you to sing now that you mention it. <laughs> I wouldn't um, uh, ask But uh, I'll ask you something else uh, instead, I'm, and I guess the question goes to everybody on the panel. You mentioned the commitment to hire 8,000 people. Uh, Duncan, you spoke to basically the, the, the task you give your, your uh, HR department. How well are HR departments prepared for disability inclusion? And well, I don't think it's yes. only the HR department that you have to look at. You have to look at how well is a company prepared. Yeah. And that goes way beyond that. That, go, that really goes into the culture of inclusion in a company. Yeah. And there is a lot of unconscious biasness that is around, amongst, around many areas of diversity, talking disability now. So you have to prepare not only uh, the candidates, you have to not only take care of unconscious biasness in the recruiting process, but you also have pre to prepare the organization itself. But you can only prepare that under a principle, not that people come in and they have uh, limited abilities. No, you have to prepare an organization that we're all God's children and have capabilities that we all need to harness and treasure. Uh, I don't believe that, you know, if a person comes in in a wheelchair, we tend to think that they are uh, worse accountants than if they <laughs> walk in. That's an unconscious biasness that we need to get rid of. That's the essence of the issue that we have. And uh, so recruiting is one thing, but working the culture in the company is far more important. Than the Thank you. Please, Duncan. You see, I think it's really, really important for companies to understand what the business case is. Because if you're not careful, you end up in tick box uh, diversity and jet in the world of gesture politics. So it's important to understand the business case and how organizations like ours build being responsible into our business models to how we make money. It's really clear in Fujitsu, we need great talent. If we put great talent in front of our customers, we'll grow and make more money. Um, so it is therefore sustainable. And I think Paul's example is great, which is Unilever figured out this is part of the business model. And therefore, it will be sustainable beyond, beyond Paul. And I think we see the, the, the evidence of, the, of that. So, so. so figure out how it makes your company money, and then it will be sustainable forever. Thank you. Julie, do you want to add to that? Only that I wholeheartedly agree. And so, you know, as we looked at this, it's a holistic transformation from, you know, training HR really to support the business leaders and their commitment as opposed to making this something that is about HR. This is about business leaders and then the company coming behind those leaders to help enable the goal. Thank you. Uh, Caroline, you mentioned a number uh, uh, in your statement and you said 80% of the disabilities are invisible. Yeah. I think it's important for our audience uh, to understand what that means. Maybe you can elaborate a little bit on that. Well, um, well, I am registered legally blind. I can't see anybody here on the panel and I certainly can't see the cameras. Um, so that is an example of somebody who it's, and I, I hid my disability. Actually, Accenture were my very first employer, so this is a big moment for me, and I hid it from them, fearful that they wouldn't want to have me as an employee, and actually that was not true. Um, but people who have mental health, um, dyslexia, um, people who have motor, neuro, like motor neuron diseases, a lot of the acquired diseases that we see or conditions are invisible. And I think it's very important to note, right now in organizations, if we were to run a confidential campaign and ask people, do they experience disability, you would most likely find out 13 to 15% of your sitting current po population within your business has a disability. So I just want to say one thing. Um, I am so extraordinarily touched and I have massive admiration for these leaders. Uh, where have you been? Um, in the sense that this is the voice. I don't think this is a HR issue. This is a leadership issue. And I want to acknowledge, because just before we came into this room, we have eight companies signed up for the Valuable 500 before we set the button. Paul wanted me to have a 1,000, but I have eight right now. And I want to acknowledge Accenture and Fujitsu and Barclays and Unilever, Omnicom, Virgin Media Group, and uh, we have Microsoft and Sinopolis in Mexico. Can I just say that is the best start 
in the world, and it's a brilliant moment, so thank you. Well, that's, that's fantastic. And uh, I think uh, you mentioned it already, we should definitely come back here uh, next year and see where we are and, and see uh, how far we surpass the 500. Um, I want to also at this point, because uh, Paul, you mentioned how, how much the forum has done to put it on the yeah. agenda. I also want to give a shout out to my uh, colleague, Mille Sander here, who's, who's done a great work to, <laughs> to, to make this possible. So um, we shouldn't forget about that. I know we're running out of time already, but let's see if there's any questions um, from the audience here. Um, there's a question from the lady in the last row. Um, the microphone is on its way. There you go. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Sophie Edwards from DevEx. A uh, question, because we, we write about uh, low and middle income countries. What are the extra challenges of achieving this in companies based in the global south? Will they be ex experiencing extra difficulties? And is there anything that maybe Unilever or other companies can do to encourage them or help them? No, for sure. I, had in, uh, I was in Kenya about uh, two months ago, and as I do on any of my visits, I, we will always uh, visit schools for the blind or the deaf blind. But I uh, asked a group of business people because at least we have a convening power a little bit. And um, so we had about 20 companies. And what was most satisfying to me was that, um, and this is positive, so take my comment positively, that most companies that were there had not thought about it. And when we had the discussions and the potential, they all made commitments to do something about it. So whilst we might say our legislation doesn't help me or the buildings are not adjusted or we don't have enough money to put everybody in school, it, at the end of the day, we're dealing here first and foremost with an issue of uh, human willpower, like on so many issues in life. And whatever part of the world you live in, if we unlock that, human willpower to do something about it, we can make major inroads everywhere. We might not achieve utopia, but we certainly can make major progress. We have 10 blind students that we sponsor at Kenyatta University, who first had to get into elementary school, then fight their way into secondary school, often fight for a braille or, or keep up with text and, and books that were not available, and then being able to go to university. I tell you, if these people would have had the luck to be cited, they would have all been presidents of the country. You know, And it's those people that we need to celebrate. A 12-year-old girl that I asked the other day what she wanted to be, and she was blind and uh, had gotten blind at the age of six, and she said she wanted to be the Minister of Education because she wanted to change the system for people with disabilities. Those are the people that we need to champion. And these people you need in every country in the world. You might be surprised, but in the UK, for example, uh, if you look at the employability rate, it's 80% amongst the, the, the people with, uh, without disabilities, but only 40% with disabilities. In the US, people that are blind only have a 15% employment. So the, the issue is not one of are there poor countries or developing countries. The issue is a global one that we need to address. And this campaign and the tools that we put behind it, sure, you need local adaption, but you need to take a global mindset here. We're talking here about the basic essence of humanity on which our system and the world functions. And frankly, any time that that is being challenged in whatever way, we as business leaders need to stand up and fight for that. That's why I'm here, fighting for the ones that are left behind, because they don't have a chance to be on this panel. Thank you, Paul, and thank you for this, uh, for this powerful um, uh, expression of support uh, here. I'm afraid I have to close the press conference now because all of the panelists are quite busy. Um, my last request would be, if you're talking about this press conference, if you're talking about the issue, if you're talking about the panel later today, use the hashtag valuable uh, on social media to get the word out to everybody and inspire more companies to sign up to this. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you very much for watching. And a special thank you to all of my panelists today. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thank